Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 declares, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 declares that God created you and me. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over everything that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Don't miss it. It was God who made us male and female. We are sexual beings by his design. Physical intimacy was his idea. Sexual fulfillment is a gift God wants us to enjoy. So why is it that sex and sexuality is the source of so much destruction and pain in our lives and in our world? How is it that what God intended to be a blessing has become a curse for so many? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to understand what God intended, what God had in mind when he made us male and female. How did God intend for us to use his gift of sex? According to God's design, under what circumstances is sex to be enjoyed? Well, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 answers that question. Immediately after God creates the first woman and brings her to the first man, we are told, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In that one brief verse, God forever defines the covenant relationship of marriage. By God's design, marriage is a lifelong relationship between one man and one woman who leave their homes of origin and who hold fast or cleave to one another in a committed, exclusive, lifelong relationship. And God's gift of sex is designed to be enjoyed only within that lifelong covenant relationship called marriage. And what that means is that all sexual activity that takes place outside of the covenant relationship of marriage, it violates God's design. All activity outside, sexual activity outside of marriage is in fact an abuse of God's gift of sex and sexuality. And it is that abuse of God's gift that so often makes sex and sexuality a source of so much destruction and pain in our world today. With that in mind, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. We as a church have been reading through the Bible this year. We're calling our reading the journey as we move through Scripture. And this week you read from 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. You read one of what I think is one of the ugliest stories in the Bible. It is a story of lust. It is a story of abuse. It is a story of grief that misusing God's gift of sex brings into life. It really starts in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, where we read how King David sexually preyed on the wife of one of his most loyal soldiers and then murdered him. Here in 2 Samuel 13, 
we come to learn that the proverb, like father, like son, stands true. Follow as I read this morning the first 20 verses of 2 Samuel chapter 13. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? And Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. And so Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, where he was lying down. And she took some dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Send everyone out from me. So everyone went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the chamber that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near him to eat, he took hold of her and he said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. And she answered, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. As for me, where could I carry my shame? As for you, you would be one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with a very great hatred so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Get up, go. But she said to him, No, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. And he called the young man who served him and said, Put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and she went away crying as she went. And her brother Absalom said to her, has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Ta Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. I told you it was an ugly story. There can be no greater abuse of God's gift of sex and sexuality than the act of rape. So before I say anything else, let me be clear. In this story, Tamar is the victim. 
Tamar bears no guilt. In God's eyes, she remains sexually pure. And if you are a victim of sexual abuse or rape, the same is true for you. In fact, it is Tamar's moral purity that leads to most of what I'm going to say this morning. Tamar was a woman who understood God's purpose for sex and sexuality. In verse 2, we learn that as an unmarried woman, Tamar valued her virginity. And because she guarded her virginity, Amnon knew that she would never submit to his lustful desires voluntarily. Now let me ask a question. As followers of Jesus Christ, before we marry, shouldn't we value virginity like Tamar valued it? Shouldn't our attitude about God's gracious gift of sex be the same as hers? Let's answer that question by discovering why Tamar valued her virginity like she did. First, as an unmarried woman, Tamar valued her virginity because Tamar understood from Scripture that the misuse of sex is a disgraceful thing. When Amnon grabbed Tamar to rape her, she pleads with him at the end of verse 12. And she says, do not do this outrageous thing. The NIV translates, don't do this wicked thing. The New American Standard translation says, do not do this disgraceful thing. You see, Tamar understood that sex outside of marriage is wicked and it is disgraceful in the eyes of God. Do we understand that? We live in a world that tells us there is no such thing as sin. And there's especially no such thing as sin when it comes to sex. We live in a world where many tell you that you need never feel ashamed, whatever you do. I mean, the movies declare it. The sitcoms tell us that it's true. Sex outside of marriage isn't wrong. It's just harmless recreation. Do it with whoever you want, whenever you want, just for fun. No consequences, no strings attached. Poor little Tamar. She never went to the movies. And apparently she didn't spend much time watching TV. That's why when her heir to the throne stepbrother pressured her to have sex, she flat out refused him. More than that, she was horrified at the thought. You know why? Unlike most people today, Tamar was convinced that sex outside of marriage is disgraceful. Now, where on earth did she get an idea like that? She got it from the Bible. Amen. Tamar got it from God's unchanging word. Tamar knew the law of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 20 and 21 addresses the issue of a young bride who is discovered to have had sex before she married. Deuteronomy 22, 20 and 21 reads, But if the thing is true, that the evidence of virginity was not found in the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones, because she has done an outrageous, a disgraceful thing in Israel by whoring in her father's house. 
And so you shall purge the evil from your midst. Now let's be clear. Today God does not instruct us to stone young women or young men who aren't virgins when they marry. And that, by the way, is an expression of the grace of God. But the point of Deuteronomy 22, verse 21, is still clear. In God's eyes, sex before marriage is a disgraceful thing, and it really doesn't matter how many people are doing it. And because sex outside of marriage is disgraceful, we learn from Scripture that it ultimately brings God's judgment. Tamar valued her virginity because she understood that the misuse of God's gift of sex is disgraceful, and she understood that the misuse of sex brings judgment. Unfortunately, not too many people believe that today. In fact, a lot of professing Christians think having sex outside of marriage is perfectly okay. And that's why it's important for us to remember that God does not reign by majority rule. In the Bible, the God who created sex tells us loud and clear Apart from repentance and faith in Christ, everyone who misuses sex, they will be judged because of their sin. They'll be judged. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 and 10 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 6 likewise says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, immorality, sexual sin, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Finally, Revelation 21 verse 8 says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers and the sexually immoral, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Our God is a gracious God. He is a patient God. But because He is also a holy God, of this we can be sure. Apart from repentance, and faith in Jesus, all sexual sin and immorality is going to be judged. Second Samuel 13, David's unmarried daughter, Tamar, she valued her virginity, her purity. Shouldn't we value, shouldn't we honor virginity among the unmarried as well? Tamar valued sexual purity because she knew that misusing God's gift of sex is a disgraceful thing. She knew that misusing God's gift of sex will bring judgment. And she also knew that misusing sex always brings grief. It brings grief. One of the greatest tragedies of Amnon's rape of Tamar was the grief that it brought into her life. In spite of her innocence, Tamar did leave Amnon's home grieving. Verse 20 says that at least for a time, she lived as a desolate woman in her brother's house. We need to remember 
Sex is a very powerful thing. Sex has the power to deepen intimacy between a husband and a wife. But when it's abused, sex also has the power to devastate your life and the lives of others too. And that is why immorality and the misuse of sex is such a despicable thing in the eyes of God. He loves us. I know if you've had sex outside of marriage, you are certainly not alone. One study reports that as many as 80% of unmarried professing Christians have had sex outside of marriage. Now, if that's true, that's tragic. In fact, it's tragic if it's 20%. Immorality won't bring you peace. Sexual sin instead brings depression and guilt. Immorality will not enrich your life. And it certainly doesn't bring you the intimacy that you desire in your life. Instead, immorality, sex outside of marriage, promotes insecurity. And spiritually speaking, sexual sin will rot you from the inside out. See, until we marry, we need to value our virginity. We need to pursue sexual purity because the misuse of sex is disgraceful in God's eyes. And because it's disgraceful in His eyes, it brings judgment. More than that, we need to pursue sexual purity because the misuse of sex brings grief. And here's one more thing. Until we marry, we need to value our virginity because the misuse of sex is not love, it's lust. The misuse of sex is not loving, it's lustful. 2 Samuel chapter 13 verse 1 tells us that Amnon, he loved Tamar. He loved her. Verse 4 says that he loved her too. So does verse 15. But we have to ask, what kind of love did Amnon have for Tamar? Is deception and lying, is that an expression of real love? Is violence and rape an expression of real love? How about throwing a woman out of your house and out of your life after you've used her to gratify yourself? Is that an expression of love? I promise you, that's not love. That is selfish lust. And tragically, selfish lust is what too many women seem to be willing to settle for today. And I beg you, young women, don't be one of those women. Don't settle for men like that. Don't forsake yourself and your God for the sake of man who talks about love on the one hand, but then who demands sex outside of the security that marriage provides on the other hand. That man has no love for you. That man has lust. You want to know what real love is? You want to know what real love looks like? And turn to 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 10. 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Here we find what real love looks like and how real love acts. At the end of 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, we are told God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. 
In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atonement for our sins. Men and women, do you want to know what real love is? Then look at the love God has for you and for me. In 1 John 4, 8 through 10, here's what we see. Verse 10. We learn that real love is unconditional. Verse 10 tells us that God doesn't love us because we first love him. God doesn't love us on the basis of what we do for him. God simply loves us unconditionally in spite of what we do. God loves us no matter what. You know what that means? It means the man who only loves you when you give him sex doesn't love you at all. That's because real love is unconditional love. If he doesn't stay around, if he won't stay around unless you give him sex, he doesn't love you. Second thing we learn about real love is that it's, only, it's always willing to sacrifice to meet needs. Listen again, verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Do you see it there? Real love does what is best for the other person. And real love does what is best for the other person, even when it costs them, even when it requires sacrifice. Now go back and think about Amnon's love. Did Amnon really love Tamar? Was his love unconditional? I think it's pretty safe to say that locking someone out of your house after you've raped them is not an act of unconditional love. So what about sacrificially meeting Tamar's needs? Was Amnon concerned about Tamar's needs? What was best for Tamar when he lured her into his room? Was Amnon concerned about Tamar's future when he raped her? Did Amnon ever have her best interest in mind? The answer is obviously no. Amnon didn't love Tamar. Amnon loved himself. And women, let me tell you, that's exactly the way it is for any man who pressures you for sex without providing you the security God intends in the covenant of marriage. A man like that has no love for you. A man like that has only lust. Why would you settle for that kind of man? Fear God. Respect yourself and tell that kind of man to take a hike. I suspect, even as I preach this, that for many of you this morning, this is not an easy sermon for you to hear. You've misused sex. You have not lived according to God's design for sex between one man, one woman, in a lifelong covenant relationship of marriage. Maybe it makes you cringe to hear that misusing sex is disgraceful in the eyes of God. Maybe it makes you anxious to re be reminded that misusing sex will bring his judgment. And you probably really don't want to be reminded of the grief that the misuse of sex has brought into your life. 
You don't want to be confronted with the reality that what you're dealing with is not love, but lust. So let me ask, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? 2 Samuel 13, verse 13. Tamar asked a question I think all of us need to ask regarding our sexual sin. Tamar asked the question, where could I, in our case, where can I carry my shame? Where can I carry my shame? You know what? For you and for me, the only answer to that question can be the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ. Yes, you are a sexual sinner. The fact is, all of us are. And yes, our immorality and our lust is disgraceful in the eyes of God. And yes, we do deserve death and condemnation. But you know what? 2,000 years ago, God became a man in Jesus. And as a man, Jesus died to pay the penalty for all our immorality and, in fact, all of our sin. And for those who believe in Jesus, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 promises, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But more than that, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to make us clean. More than that, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. She is a new creation. Let me encourage you. Those promises are true. Those promises are true. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. You can come to Jesus with your shame. And if you're willing to repent, and if you will put your faith in what he did for you when he died on the cross, if you will trust him as your savior, if you will follow him as your Lord, he'll give you a new life. He'll give you a new start. And you won't ever have to look back again. You'll never have to be ashamed again.